37 and 38. Now you may be wondering, what is this, the water is why? Well, it's from, it's from a Scottish folk song that was written in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And it really has a beautiful, haunting melody. I enjoy yes, listening yeah. to it just because of the melody of the uh, song. Uh, the words, though, are not so good. <laughs> it's a real sad, really sad song. And it really describes to us how love operates in the unbelieving world all around us. Um, when we take, for instance, this stanza in the song, O oh, love, be handsome, and love be kind. Gay as a jewel, gay used back then was happy, you know. That word has been hijacked, so mm -hmm. kids always titter at it when you use it. But gay as a jewel when first it is new, but love grows old and waxes cold and fades like the morning dew. So the promise, you say, well, does it end on a happy note at least? Well, the, the promise for reconciliation doesn't hold out much hope. The last line of the song reads, when roses bloom in winter's gloom, then will my love return to me. Well, you know, winter's gloom. Uh, roses don't typically bloom in winter's gloom, so he's not going to be returning or she's not going to be returning, depending on the perspective there. So when it comes to human beings, and even I would have to say Christians, there is an ebb and flow to life. And so uh, when it comes to worldly love, you see that it increases, it de decreases. And I've often thought about that because then I think about the love that God has for me. The Bible teaches me that it's unchanging. In other words, when I'm ugly or I'm not feeling great, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about my mood being ugly. I could be ugly physically too. But I'm talking about being ugly in, in a mood that, that is just... Uh, dejected or, or feeling desolate or depressed or whatever, God still loves me. His grace is still invading my life. The Spirit of God is still there to bolster my own spirit. It, 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 I look at life today and I am thankful for the fact that not only do I have a family and I can choose to love my family, but, but to love the congregation that God has put me in to serve, to love the kids that I'm teaching right now in the third and fourth grade and their parents. God gives us an inexhaustible supply of love that's constantly flowing, as our text indicates, constantly flowing in and through us. And that's because of the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And you want to talk about wide water. I mean, when, when God's love comes down, it comes down like a torrent in a wadi in Palestine. It is something that the scripture talks about as being uh, so fulfilling and inexhaustible. It's living water, Jesus talked about it being something that's constantly coming up from the ground. You can never exhaust the supply of it. It is fresh. It is cold. It is just what you need. And so when we see the metaphor here that's being used, uh, it's a great metaphor. The Holy Spirit is flowing like rivers of living water within us. And, and everything downstream from us, the metaphor, if we kind of extend it out, is benefit from that. And so we want to live our lives in such a way that he is moving and working and loving us, and that love is flowing in and through us so that we can love others around me. And so God gives me the same confidence that the Lord Jesus had, if you really think about it in this text. Uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said in the Beatitudes. We thirst for righteousness. But the great thing about that is, even though I'm thirsty every day, I find satisfying water in the Word of God. And I find satisfying water in my relationship with Him. Now, there is a rhythm to life. There is this ebb and flow in life where uh, things rise and fall. I mean, it just is that way. We live in a sinful world. But, but for us, the ebb and flow is measured by our dependence. 
the more trials come into our lives, the more dependence increases. And I don't know about you, but when things get really, really difficult, then the Lord is very, very close to me. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't exchange that for anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope you wouldn't either. So our objective is to live in the flow of the Holy Spirit. And whatever God wants to do to accomplish that in me, I'm willing for it to take place. So he will never forsake us. His love is unchangeable. So we should not forsake him. We should draw close to him. The fountain of living waters. And, and you know, Jeremiah talks about the options we have. <laughs> we have options, right? We can uh, fill our lives with the brackish water that we have these worldly cisterns that can really hold no water. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 tells us, well, instead of that, why don't you fill yourself with all the fullness of Christ? We want all the fullness of Christ to dwell in us as believers. As a matter of fact, when I pray for you, I pray that. Mm -hmm. I pray that the fullness of Christ would dwell in you. And that that would do its transforming work in your life. John chapter 1 verse 16 says that we have received grace for grace. And that too is fullness. The idea of grace for grace is grace upon grace upon grace ad infinitum. Right? He is constantly uh, giving us the grace that we need to take the next step that we need to in life. Our God will supply all our need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, or by Christ Jesus. Right. And that's Philippians 4.19. So one of the greatest gifts that we have in life is the flow of living water. The flow of living water, or I like to say the eternal quality of life that God has put uh, in us. That present-day reality for believers who have trusted in Jesus says right here in John chapter 7 we have to believe in him to have this and so we put our trust in him we believed in the crucified risen and now raised ascended Christ and because of that we have the water of the word we have the word himself at work in us so I want to briefly go through three types of water this evening that before we pray together and hopefully it'll be an encouragement to you the the first idea is the waters of the world, then the waters of the worry, and then finally the waters of the word. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't be taking a long time, but I, I like these thoughts here uh, from, from the scripture as we carry out the metaphor of water. First of all, the waters of the world came from the idea that we saw in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. You're exchanging... At this point, the fountains of living water, God said to his people, for the brackish waters that collect in broken cisterns. The idea is all of these uh, clay pottery shards that are laying around, and, and they collect water, but it's brown and brackish. It's been sitting there a while in the sun, and uh, that's what they're going after when they have this artesian spring that's just constantly welling up water, providing exactly what they need, and they are forsaking that for the brackish waters of the world. You kind of wonder about people like that, if they are even saved, um, to take shards of pottery uh, and collect water and to cling to that really is a sad sight. And those things can really not even hold water, the, the text tells us, because they're so small and broken. They're broken cisterns. And yet, people pitifully are running around trying to collect it in the world around us. Now, can you think of things that align with the waters of the world? I mean, it's people who are clinging to an election or clinging to a series that they're watching on TV or <coughs> clinging maybe to a person. And if I just have this person in my life, I'm going to be okay. This is the waters of the world. What's awaiting people who put all of their stock in the things of this life, this temporal life? Well, condemnation. The Bible's pretty clear about that. Condemnation awaits people who prefer the wide waters of the world because they've exchanged the living water for that. And that's why they're all preoccupied with the things of this life. Right. And for them to step away from this life and to spend time with God, they don't even think about that. Right? Their, their knowledge of God is cursory and fleeting.
fleeting. And the only time that they really give it any thought is when they're in true danger. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, <coughs> broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Think about that. No water. And, and they suffer condemnation. They leave this world, they go to the life to come, and they are forever in hell. And at that point, they'll be begging for just one drop of water to bathe their weary tongue. And there will be no water for them. That's sad. There is the water of the world, but there's also the water of the worried. All right? These are people who are, are really struggling with doubt and and they wonder if the wide waters of God's mercy are available to them. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, <laughs> pastors make them feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, they make people feel like, well, God is, would never be there for you. Right? It, it's not unlike the Pharisees that we saw in the text this evening. In other words, God isn't there for you, but he's there for me because I have been righteous. All right? No hope for the people around them. And so people are worried. They're concerned. They, they come to the place where they cannot believe. I've even witnessed to people who feel like they cannot believe. They're, they're past the point of no return. That God has already forsaken them. That there is no hope for them. But God has a message for people who are worried. It's found in Isaiah 41, verses 17 and 18. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers at desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry lands springs of water. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So the text is teaching us that we need to put away worry and put away fear. We need to wait patiently upon the Lord when we pray tonight. Okay? If we're worried, if we're all tied up about something or someone in our lives, well, know that God will not fail you. The scriptures are clear that he will continually guide you, it says in Isaiah 58 and verse 11, and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Yeah, there are the waters of the world, the waters of the worry, and then finally this evening, the waters of the word. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. An unending an unyielding supply. Jesus is the word, of course. We know that to be true. And so he gives us living waters. This is the water of life that he spoke to the woman at the well uh, about in John chapter 4. We thirst for these waters while continually drinking from those waters. So that thirst is quenched. We're not in a position where we're left unsatisfied. I'm satisfied every day when I draw from the wells of water, which are everlasting life. When I get up in the morning and I open up my Bible and I spend my first moments with the Lord alone, okay, that's what drawing from the fountain of water springing unto everlasting life is all about. We are sorrowful in this world, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when I look at what's happening with the election and the way that our country is going, it makes me sad. Uh, and, and disappointed in our country. And yet, even though I'm sorrowful, in, in my day I'm always rejoicing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10? He said, yet always rejoicing. He said, as poor, yet we're always making people rich. As having nothing, and yet we're possessing all things. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10. And so when we pray tonight, we are feeding on the word. Mm. We're partaking of these waters of life. The spirit is bringing that everlasting supply of grace and truth into our lives. And because of that, you and I can abound in thanksgiving. We can abound in righteousness. 
unto the praise and glory of God. The Bible says that the righteous are a tree of life. We're drawing from the waters, the river uh, that is beside us. And we eat of life-giving fruits. And we ourselves, the Bible continues that metaphor, we ourselves are God's wells of salvation. And so God can use us to reach other people who are parched in this dry and barren wilderness called the world. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. We pray that you would help us to uh, not look to our circumstances or to the people that are around us, but uh, to look to you in order to have all that we need to best serve the people around us. Lord, uh, we pray that you would bless our prayer meeting. Uh, help us be able to share our requests together. Pray in such a way that we see heaven come down. And Lord, we ask that we would see over and over again answers to prayer in our midst. We love you so much. Help us to glorify your name. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. All right. I hope you'll stay and, and pray with us this evening. The men will stay here in the auditorium, the ladies will meet in the library to break up. First grade.